Welcome to episode 274 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm all right, Rob. How are you doing? Doing good. Don't have uh, too much to share myself. We're getting close to uh, Thanksgiving under these strange times. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe our guest today already had Thanksgiving, actually. <laughs> mm. It's true. It is celebrated in, in other countries differently, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll get to him in a moment then. But first, uh, at the top of our episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Um, so we had uh, Teresa Johnson on a couple weeks ago talking about Thin LTO. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we may have asked the question at one point, like, if she knew what MSVC's linker was like. Right. And uh, we got an email from Kenny Kerr, who we found on the show a while ago. And uh, he wrote, hope you're well. Uh, I wanted to point out that following your recent show on Thin LTO, someone was internally asking about Visual C++ and asking when it would catch up. Uh, he says he hasn't listened to the show yet, but wanted to let us know that Visual Studio has had multi-threaded compilation uh, and multi-threaded link time code generation for years. And if anything, uh, Thin LTO is more like how link time code generation works today in Visual Studio. So, uh, and he says the Windows builds rely heavily on this. Otherwise, it would basically take forever to compile. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll have someone to talk about uh, the Visual Studio linker in more detail sometime. Yeah, I don't think we've ever really talked about that. It's, I feel like the open source linkers get a lot more of the conversation than the Visual Studio one, which a lot of our listeners use. Yeah. And it, but it's certainly good to know that uh, you know we they have this link time code generation feature option. So if Thin LTO sounded great and wonderful to you, uh, you know Visual Studio has similar support. Right. Yeah. Okay. We'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cppcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube. Joining us today is Connor Hoekstra. Connor is a senior library software engineer at NVIDIA working on the Rapids team. He is extremely passionate about programming languages, algorithms, and beautiful code. He is the founder and organizer of the Programming Languages Virtual Meetup, and he has a YouTube channel. He also recently announced at Meeting C++ and C++ Russia that he is starting a podcast with Bryce Alstein Lelbach called the Algorithms Plus Data Structures Equals Programs Podcast. Connor, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. This is uh, super exciting. And this is another freaking competitor to our podcast, Rob. <laughs> so to be clear, we have our own competitor. We don't compete with CPP Chat or CPP Cast. <laughs> our, our, I didn't declare these our competitors. This is Bryce is doing, but there's another podcast uh, that's been kicked off by Jeff Bastian called TLB uh, H or TLB Hit, but the TLB, yeah. domain is TLBH.it that I think Hannah Dusakova helped them set up. Um, and yeah, so Bryce, Bryce's one sort of talking point to me was like, as long as we're better than uh, JF's podcast, uh, I'll be happy. <laughs> so we're apparently competing with them, not with you. Um, good to know, good to know. So have you released any episodes yet? Uh, we have recorded our first episode, and I'm in the midst of editing it and setting up, you know, all the podcasting things. Um, but by the time your listeners are listening to this, it should be online, and if people want to check it out, um, I'm sure the information will be in the show notes. So, I cool. just say, as we've told many other people, consistency is the key. If you do one episode and then never release another one again, you probably won't get a lot of listeners. Yeah, ours. The goal for me is for it to be a very low overhead podcast. So it's inspired by a podcast called Magic Read Along, which is just uh, two guys that sort of hop on a phone call for 20 minutes, and like half the time they're not talking about anything programming related and then every once in a while they'll just drop into category theory um, <laughs> uh, so half the time you're hearing about what they're eating for dinner or barbecue and the other times you know you're hearing some interesting things about adjunctions and um, you know catamorphisms and stuff like that uh, so hopefully it's just gonna be that you know little very little editing and uh, with that low overhead hopefully it'll be easy to pump them out you know once a week like you guys do yeah sounds cool and sorry but Canadian Thanksgiving. What was that? Two week, two weeks ago. Two weeks? Uh, it was back in October. So yes, oh. the re the real Thanksgiving, the Canadian Thanksgiving, <laughs> um, is uh, about a month earlier. Depends because it fluctuates from year to year for for us. I'm not sure if it's the same for you for American Thanksgiving. It's the 
It's always Thir- the second Thursday. last Thursday. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> right. Yeah. It should be interesting to to see or hear how many people are visiting or how many people are just celebrating individually. Yeah. Yeah. Stay we're safe, getting everybody. A, yeah. We're getting a pretty significant phase of real closures in Colorado right now leading up to this. Um, so, yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Okay, well, Connor, we got a couple of news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and we'll start talking more about what you've been up to lately, okay? Sounds good. Okay, so this first one is a uh, new library. It's on GitHub, and it's called Butano, a modern C++ high-level engine for the Game Boy Advance. And, uh, you know, we've talked about emulators a lot in the past, but I've never heard of emulators, but uh, this one looks pretty neat. Well, it's not a Game Boy emulator. It's a C++ library for writing Game Boy games. Okay, okay. I misread that then. So, do you need an emulator, or is a Game Boy Advance something you can kind of still easily uh, get and and put a game onto? That's one thing. I would say you can easily get a Game Boy Advance. Getting a game onto it is slightly harder. You have to get one of the hobbyist cartridges that lets you put an SD card in Mm -hmm. it or write write your own ROM. Right. Um, But if you use the this tool to program and then launch in an emulator, that would by far be the easiest way to to play with this. Right. Very cool. Uh, discussed this with a couple of people. It came up at some point recently. It might have been at meeting C++ when we were hanging out. I'm not sure. And someone's like, oh, well, that's that's too new for Jason, basically. Because Game, <laughs> Game Boy Advance is like an ARM 7 processor. So it's actually got wide support with compilers um, with GCC and Clang, which yeah. helps a lot for this. Not, I'm not trying to downplay the achievement or anything because something I've actually thought about doing was like how hard would it be to bootstrap some C++ code on a Game Boy Advance and then I gave up shortly after I came up with the idea <laughs> so I didn't mess with it again okay. you do any Game Boy Advance programming Connor? I do not know I didn't even have uh, a Game Boy um, I was in school when they came out uh, but yeah it was it was typically at recess you'd have you know four or five kids in class that had a Game Boy and then everyone would be huddled around them um, yeah while they were playing their uh, you know Pokemon Blue or Red or whatever those games were called I did not play Pokemon either so <laughs> <laughs> when the uh, the AR game came out and everyone was freaking out I didn't really didn't really have the context of like catching them all when I was a kid I agree yeah, I never played either. Yes. Did you get in on that, Rob? No, I didn't have a Game Boy as a kid either. No, but did you get in on the uh, Pokemon thing? Um, no, no, <laughs> I've, I've never been into Pokemon. I, I think I, I watched some of the cartoons as a kid, but never played the games. Okay. I have an anecdote about Pokemon Go. I had uh, uh, worked with an intern once at my first job that had written a, a small uh, program to send him texts whenever uh, there was a Pokemon that was within a 10-minute walking radius um, that he currently didn't have in his whatever uh, library. Um, and so every once in a while, I'd see this intern, like, jump up from his desk and, like, bolt and say, I'll be back! <laughs> and he'd be running out to get some rare Pokemon that popped up a couple blocks away, which I just thought was fantastic, that there was nice. this Pokemon it's... Go API you could hook into to do stuff like that. There's still people who are, like, really into that game. My wife and I went to the park a few weeks ago and saw all these people heads down on their phones, and there was, like, a Pokemon Go meetup going on at the park. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. It gets, yeah. uh, gets people out doing sure. more exercise things. It's, it's great. Yeah, yeah true. Okay, uh, next thing we have. We haven't talked about Boost in a while, but uh, we have this article uh, that version 1.75 is coming out soon, I think. It says in progress. I'm not quite sure what that means in terms of their release schedule, uh, but they are adding a few new libraries with this upcoming release. So there's going to be a new Boost JSON library, uh, obviously for JSON parsing and serialization. And there's also Leaf, which is a lightweight error handling library, and PFR, which I feel like we've heard of Leaf before. Sounds I don't know. No? 
I don't remember. As usual, I got distracted by the first thing and went down a little rabbit hole looking through the source code of the Boost JSON library and looking at how their allocator support works because allocators are something that I've been thinking about lately. Mm -hmm. And then I forgot to come back to this particular <laughs> article and look at the other two libraries. <laughs> well, how's the Boost JSON library source code looking to you? It looks very boosty. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of macros for boost things and and boost things used in the in the boost library um but other than that it looks like it has fairly straightforward allocator support for passing in your own uh memory resource and using your own kind of allocators with it which is the part that i was actually interested in okay Connor, you have a chance to look at any of these yeah i took a glance uh the one thing that caught my eye was the um uh, addition to the mp11 uh, metaprogramming library so uh, Barry Revzin uh, had requested an algorithm that ended up getting named pairwise fold, which is the sort of equivalent, the uh, metaprogramming equivalent of adjacent difference um, with a different name. So it takes adjacent elements implies and applies a binary operation to each pair of elements. Um, so interestingly, because Barry actually messaged me a couple weeks ago about this when it got added, um, and then I was like, why did you, why did you call it pairwise fold? Um, and then he didn't actually realize the name that it had ended up with. I think he initially requested um, zip tail width. So zip width um, is an algorithm from Haskell that takes two ranges and applies a binary operation. And zip tail is a trick where you do that sort of the first one, uh, zero to n minus one elements and the second to n elements, which gives you adjacent pairs when you zip those two ranges. Um, so zip tail width is sort of the combination of zip tail and zip width. Um, and then they threw around a couple of different names like pairwise. I could get this wrong. I think it's from Kotlin um, or some other language that is the equivalent of sort of like um, adjacent elements. Uh, but they ended up adding fold to it, and it's not a fold. Um, so uh, when Barry realized that, he was like, oh, no, that wasn't one of the names we actually considered. We considered pairwise, but somehow fold got added on to it. So um, that's an interesting story. <laughs> so MP11 yeah. is a compile time algorithms, right? Metaprogramming I, compile time. I believe so, yeah. So, I mean, without looking at this, that that implies to me that it's taking, like, two sets of types and doing a pairwise operation on the types? Yeah, I think potentially that is that is one one thing you can do with it. Okay. But not a fold. Yeah, I mean it's interesting like the naming history on these things. Like in, in the textbook that I'm working my way through, SICP, the structure and interpretation of computer programs, they call um, a map, so like our equivalent of a stood transform that takes uh, and variadic number of sequences. So our std transform can take one range or two ranges. But hypothetically, you could have a std transform that takes any number of sequences. And then instead of a unary operation or a binary operation to transform those, it can just take an nary operation. Um, uh, so a lot of languages, they just call this map, um, Python uh, and Clojure and Racket. So Lisp dialects and Python do that. In the structure interpretation of computer programs, they call it accumulate n. Um, which coming from like C++ land is very confusing because you would think that like typically underscore n for us means uh, on a subset of the first n elements of your range and right. accumulate is our our name for reduction. Um, but when you think about it, like when you're uh, when you're transforming uh, n like n elements from n sequences at a time down to one, uh, it's not really you're not folding one by one over the elements, but you, you could argue that that is, in a sense, a reduction. Um, and then, so they're sort of basically saying it's a, you're accumulating over n of those elements. Anyways, like, there's there's a, a bit of a reduction, a bit of a transform, and every language sort of makes different decisions. So uh, naming is hard, as they say. Right, it is hard. Okay, uh, last article we have is a trip report, a virtual trip report, I guess, from uh, Herb Sutter. And this is about the Autumn ISO C++ standards meeting, which was uh, held virtually. And uh, we briefly talked about this a few weeks ago when uh, we had Sean Heed and Aaron and, and Peter on. 
And uh, yeah, it's great to hear that they were able to actually vote on some papers uh, for C23 during this virtual meeting. And as I just mentioned, John Heed, um, he was actually, his paper was the first one to get voted into C23, which is pretty exciting. He, he has his paper uh, PO330, which is going to add a UZ literal suffix to the language um, for numbers of size T type. I'm, yes, I mean, I, I, I needed this suffix like four <laughs> times on yeah. one day. Basically, I'm like static cast, static cast. Mm-hmm. All right, like yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, although it makes me wonder if there's UZ for unsigned size T. No, I mean size T, which is unsigned. Is I knew there had been some discussion about like an SZ or something also for signed size T, which is in places in the standard. Also, it just makes me wonder if there's a signed and an unsigned version or not, but. I didn't read the paper to find out. Connor, you have any do, do, are we getting both signed and unsigned versions of this? Ah, it oh. looks like U Z and Z, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's good to see um the committee still making progress. I know there are differing camps on um whether C plus plus twenty three, we should still be aiming for it to. So there's a paper a while ago, a bold plan for C plus plus twenty three. If we should still aim for that, or some sort of arguing, we should slow down a bit due to COVID times and make this sort of more of a C plus plus fourteen style, just you know, oh, fix. Po- yeah. polishing yeah features that went into twenty. Um, but yeah, I, I most programming languages, um, whether it's designed by committee or sort of um, designed by uh, a core group of developers and you can submit, you know, PEPs, whether that's for Python or JEPs for Java. A lot of these languages already, you know, even before COVID, um, have their uh, development like cycle on GitHub and online. So um, I'm really happy to see that C++ is still making progress and slowly sort of transitioning uh, to that model. I should mention just a couple of other things that they did vote into C23. We're also going to get a uh, string contains function, which is another one that uh, I think we should all be excited about that we'll finally have. So you can just say if string contains whatever. It's a part of, it's, yeah, as opposed to having to you know, write that you know, by hand or something like that. The find does yeah. not equal end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and also, did you note that Richard Smith is no longer going to be lead editor of the standard? I did not see that. Thank you to Richard Smith for his work for many years as project editor for the C++ standard and completing C++ 20 this month. Oh, yeah. Um, starting now, we begin C++ 23 with Thomas Koop, who has graciously agreed to step up as the primary project editor, while Richard will stay on as backup project editor. Very cool. Good for him. We should have either Richard or, or Thomas on. We've never had either of them on. No, nope, the we have not. Yeah. Yeah. Were you involved at all uh, in this meeting, Connor? Um, I was uh, briefly an attendee. I had multiple meetings going on at that time. Um, okay. Uh, but I have been meeting with uh, a small sort of algorithm slash ranges group for the last few months, um, sort of working on the paper that ended up going into the most recent mailing. And we'll discuss that in a minute, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, why don't we start talking more about uh, what you've been up to lately, Connor? I know we just had meeting C++ 2020 uh, last week, and you gave a new talk there. Is that right? Yep. Um, Yeah, I attended not all of the conference, um, but it was, I think, over three days. And I think we we all saw, or I definitely saw um, Jason at a couple tables and... Were you there too, Rob? I can't, I think. Yeah, we... Jason and I both did a Q&A and, and hung around for a bit after that. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. I caught the second half of your Q&A because I was in and out of work meetings. Um, yeah, how did you guys find Meeting C++ online? I, I didn't stick around for much more of the conference after our Q&A, unfortunately. I just had too much other stuff going on to uh, to be an attendee this year. Yeah, I also, I mean, I hung out for a while, and as always, it's good to see people even if remotely who we haven't yeah. seen in a while um and it was fun doing the ama i think mm-hmm. uh i'd do that again um 
And I think it went well. Yeah. 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 I guess the time zones are a bit hard too for us because it starts, I think, 2 a.m. locally for me, which means even earlier for for you. <laughs> yeah, it would be like midnight that it was starting for me, which so, so yeah. yeah, not not ideal times. Um, <laughs> no, not ideal. We got to talk to Jens about that. What was he thinking? <laughs> yeah. <really. laughs> Well, so what was your uh, your talk this year at Meeting C++? Um, so this this uh, year, I gave a talk called C++ Concepts uh, versus Rust Traits versus Swift Protocols versus Haskell Type Classes, or some permutation of those language features. Um, I don't recall the exact order. Um, and this was, uh, this was a talk that uh, over a period of like two years uh, in my head of sort of watching different videos and reading different content, I had this realization that um, the C++20 concepts uh, facility that we were getting has existed um, in other languages for decades um, or something very similar and has been added to more modern languages like Rust and Swift. Um, the first time uh, so I mentioned this all in the talk, I'll give like an abridged, abridged version of it, but the first time I sort of realized this was in 2018 when I started learning Haskell. Um, I learned about type classes, which basically uh, let you specify the class of a generic type um, and then basically enables you to do certain operations with that generic type. So when you have a generic function in Haskell that just uh, as a single input takes a generic type A and um, returns as output a generic type A, um, you can really only do one thing with that function in Haskell, um, which is return it. Because you don't know that you can do anything else with a generic type. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a function in functional programming called identity. And I explicitly remember learning about this on another podcast called LambdaCast, which I actually started listening to because you mentioned it once uh, in, in the, your sort of introductory um, okay. uh, you know, news items in one of your episodes. And they sort of talked about this uh, identity function um, and it sounds like the most useless thing, like why would you ever want a function that does nothing and just returns you back uh, what you have? But if you start delving into the functional programming world, it actually is very useful in certain cases. Um, one of them, for instance, is um, it doesn't exist in the STL, but in the uh, CUDA equivalent of the STL, um, Thrust, we have algorithms uh, that take basically, in some cases, a third range um, which is known as a stencil. It's very, very similar to projections in C++ 20 range algorithms. And so you can do something like um, a copy if um, that takes two ranges where it copies elements from the first range based if the unary predicate um, is, returns true when applied to the second range. So in a uh, std copy in the STL, you always have to apply the unary predicate to the range that you are specifying because only, you're only allowed to specify one. Um, but an alternate design for that algorithm could be taking two ranges. Um, the second one, which you don't copy, but you're just checking. So it's sort of similar if anyone out there is familiar with Excel to a uh, function in Excel called sum if. It basically sums up elements in a certain range based on another uh, range. Um, it's the exact same idea. But uh, sometimes uh, for a copy, if you're just copying, but if you have some equivalent of like a transform, um, the thrust identity might be actually what you want um, in that case, um, or std identity, which we're getting in C++20. Anyways, back to Haskell. Um, that generic A to a generic A, it's called identity. Um, and uh, this, the type classes give you the ability to say, well, my generic type A is in the type class of num, which sort of means stands for numeric. And now you can do more with it. You can add them together. You can do things that you can do with numeric, uh, generic types. Um, and then ultimately in the talk, I sort of show the Swift protocols and Rust traits. I also include D-type constraints. And sort of the points of my talk that I really try to drive home is that um, in this broad category of what uh, in sort of academia is referred to as constrained parametric polymorphism, um, there's two categories. The concept model, uh, which I sort of term type constraints, and then the type class model, um, which I just sort of stole the name from Haskell. And so Rust, Swift, and Haskell fit into the type class uh, model. And uh, D type constraints and C++ concepts fit into the type constraint uh, model. And so the difference is that where in Haskell or the type class model, you start with a generic function 
um, that you can't do anything with, and then you have to specify the type classes in order to do more things with it. Um, in the concept model, it's the exact opposite. Um, right. You start with a generic function in C++, you know, now you can just go auto uh, F um, and with a parameter, you know, auto P, and that returns, you know, uh, an auto P. So it's a generic function that, you know, takes a single argument and has a single output. Um, but you can do absolutely anything with this. It might not compile, uh, but you don't need to do any extra specifications in order to say, you know, oh, this can work with some, you know, it's got a dot name method or a dot area. So the example in my talk I show is um, having a, a, a shape concept um, and then like a circle class and a rectangle class that adhere to this concept. Um, in C++, you don't need to specify that shape um, concept in order to uh, get the code to work. You start with the world and then you constrain with a concept what you're able to do with that generic type. Um, anyway, so they're, they're sort of completely opposite to each other and I find it very interesting that um, in certain languages like Swift, they, they refer to their, uh, this parametric polymorphism as constrained generics when really, uh, when, so when they say unconstrained generics, that's a generic function that doesn't have any constraints on it, which you can do nothing with. Um, mm. And then by adding mm. the constraints, you can do more. Um, which sort of seems like they they have the terminology backwards, and I've I've talked to a few people and they've shared like motivations for you know potentially why they did it that way, um, but I think that's it's it's a key thing to sort of understanding that um, in C plus uh, plus we start with the world and by adding concepts you are basically restricting what you can do with your function, but in many other languages it's the exact opposite. You start with a generic function that does very little, and then you enable it. Uh, to do more by adding the constraints to your generic type. Um, so that's sort of, in a nutshell, what the talk's about. Interesting. You get good feedback, good questions from the audience? Um, yeah, there was a few questions uh, at the end. Uh, it was a, it was a, originally a 90-minute talk that I sort of cut 20% out of, and it was supposed to be a 60-minute talk, so uh, it, it was pretty a pretty quick cadence. Um, but afterwards, we hopped into sort of a remote Q&A, um, one of the questions I got was, how come I didn't uh, compare um, these language features to Java interfaces? Um, C Sharp also has interfaces. Go also has a language facility called interfaces, but it's slightly different um, than what Java and C Sharp have. Um, definitely, you can do a comparison between those, uh, but I can't cover every language out there in a 60-minute talk. And <laughs> I said that my primary motivation was that I was trying to choose languages that were um, adjacent to C++ and that operate sort of in the same space. So um, definitely Rust, you know, a lot of people say in the same breath as C++. D, although a lot less popular, um, is extremely influenced by C++. Um, Swift is a very, very interesting language that I knew absolutely nothing about um, going into sort of preparing for the talk. Um, and it is a it is a very, very pleasant, pleasant language to use. And I wish, I wish they were focused more on sort of cross-platform and not just like uh, mobile app development for iOS. Because um, it's, it like, when you start off with Swift, it feels like Python. Um, and Chris Latner, the designer of the language, he focused on um, one of the values for the languages that he want, for, for the language Swift that he wanted was something called um, progressive disclosure of complexity, otherwise sometimes referred to as um, he wanted the language to be infinitely hackable. So that like it feels like Python at first, which it truly does. Like you open up the playground online, you type print parentheses, hello world, and parentheses, like exactly like you would in Python, and it works. Um, but but slowly as you start to learn the language, you can sort of peel back the layers, um, and it's it's an amazing experience. Like coming from the world of C++, where we don't necessarily have the best. Um, like now, thanks to Gobble, um, I think it's a lot easier to go and just start typing away. Uh, mm -hmm. and getting started with C++, but like historically C++ has uh, sort of like first impression experience um, if someone's not holding your hand and you very quickly, like I remember the first time in high school trying to get, where was it, university? It was a while ago when I was trying to get started with C++ and it was just awful. You had to go download things and get them all set up and then and nothing worked for three hours um, and then finally I think I just ended up getting Visual Studio uh, working, which was the easiest way, but yeah, um, there's there's a long way to go, I think, in C++ in terms of our like first impression experience that we that we have. I kind of feel like collectively we lost a lot in the 
80s to 90s transition where every computer you turned it on and immediately had a programming environment. I mean, it was basic, but you had a programming environment as soon as you turned it on that you had to do some programming to, to use it or uh, you could very easily, if you chose to, just type things in and see what happened. And yeah, now you're like, you don't, that doesn't exist so much in the same way anymore. Yeah, it's it's part of the reason I think why Python, you know, there's many reasons you can stipulate why Python became so popular, but um, with basically like every Linux distro, it, it's just automatically bundled. Um, and you just type Python and poof, you hop down into the whatever command line editor or interpreter um, and... Uh, yeah, I think for, I think for any language that can get like automatically included in a bunch of operating systems, um, that's going to give you a, a big headwind. Yeah, I feel like uh, for those of us who are maybe slightly older, it feels like Python completely replaced Perl somehow. Because Perl's, I believe, actually part of the POSIX standard, so you knew Perl was always going to be there. And now I don't know. The one programmer that I knew who chose to do Perl for all time is now no longer doing Perl after. <laughs> like 15 years or whatever it was that he programmed in Perl. Yeah, Perl. I feel bad for Perl. Like, I only ever spent, like, half a week of my um, career working in Perl. I had to debug Perl. Um, and uh, I so I don't know much about it, all that. Uh, other than that, like, everyone says it's one of, you know, the, the write once, read never, um, yeah. impossible to read languages. But, like, I actually, um, I think Perl is one of those languages that, like, if you write it well which I think the the Perl code, I wasn't an expert, but it, it seemed nice, and I really liked, like, the single character, although this is coming from someone whose favorite uh, language is APL, so... I was just going to say that. <laughs> the single character, like, uh, you know, notation for, like, this is a hash map, this is an array, uh, I, I love that stuff. Um, and that's, if you think about it, Python is somewhat similar to that. When you go, like, variable equals uh, braces, that's a dictionary. When you go variable equals, that's a list. Um, you have to go equal set for a, a, a hash set, but um, I don't know. Like I think Python developers know what that means when they when they see you know L equals bracket bracket, they know that that's a list, uh, right. which is some, somewhat similar to you know what Perl was relying on. So I don't know. I feel all these languages they get bad raps. I, I just feel bad for them. We just need to we need to love all our programming languages, even if they've fallen out of favor. <laughs> <laughs> like. This this programming language needs a home. Would someone be willing to adopt it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, going back to your talk on on concepts and, and comparing it with these features of other languages, um, you know, as someone who has studied and, and worked with all these languages, do you have a preference for you know the constrained way concepts work versus uh, the type classes where you have to you know, start adding to the type classes in order to be able to use it? Yeah, my my personal preference um, is the type class model. Um, mm -hmm. But this is like one of the classic um, sort of trade-offs where people fall into two different camps. Um, there are people that, like, it's, this, it's the same argument, in my opinion, as like dynamic versus static typing. There are certain language facilities or features um, that require sort of more upfront thinking. Um, and the trade-off is that uh, you're going to have static analyzers that are going to be able to tell you more, and you have more sort of um, uh, sureness of whether your code's going to be like correct at the time you run it. Whereas, you know, with other languages like Python and JavaScript, you can just sort of write it; it'll run, and you'll find out at runtime uh, or like a month later if it works. <laughs> Um, and I think there's use case, there's times when you just need to prototype and get some, you know, proof of concept out the door. Um, and there's other times where, like, being sure that something's running correctly is, is more important. Um, I tend to always fall on the side of, like, I would prefer static typing so that, you know, my compiler can do more for me. Um, I would prefer to, like, specify the concepts up front and, like, be, have the compiler force me to think about, like, what do I actually want to enable my generic type to have? Whereas in the in the C++ model, we now, and, and this is also sort of a legacy thing, right? Like we, we yeah. are building this on top of templates, you know, potentially they would have designed it um, in the type class way if they could have. Right. Um, and so I, I have no like qualms with the, the design. I think it's probably a necessity. Um, but if, if I was starting from scratch, I think, like I prefer the model that says, maybe let's spend a little bit more time thinking up front and let's get more guarantees later um, 
because I would I would prefer to spend more time thinking than uh, more time like debugging later um, is yeah. my personal preference. But like I said, like I understand the arguments for both, and there are some times when like I've been trying to do something in language X, and I'm just like, let me just try this in Python, and then like it was 45 minutes wasted, and then five minutes in Python, I have it working. Um, and so, and so, yeah. There's there's a time and a place I think for for different languages. Okay. So, if you don't mind, if we go back in time a little bit here, uh, shortly, I think after we had you on the first time, you ended up giving the most awarded C plus plus talk ever, I believe. If we were to uh, to quantify these things, when you gave your algorithm intuition talk at C plus plus now which was well regarded and we we discussed with Tony how jilted he felt because he didn't <laughs> win any awards that year but you know that's that's all fine that's history but uh, since then i mean you've you've developed uh, you've done several talks now on algorithms and algorithm intuition and uh, it's a huge topic but um I, it's something we sh we need to talk about because it's it's been so well well accepted talks uh what kind of things do you talk about in those in those talks? What's your favorite talk? You know, well, so know. the first thing I should say, because uh, I know now that you've mentioned Tony's name, I'm going to hear about this from him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Tony uh, was actually at that uh, C Now 2019. Um, so I had heard from him that he was a bit upset uh, that. You know, first of all, I think a couple awards were added that year, like Best New Speaker, which I won. Right, right. And then he said that that's not really fair. Like, you can't you can't just add awards and then say, you know, because <laughs> his claim was that he would have won that stuff in the past. Anyways, <laughs> Tony was all set to come back in 2020, and apparently he was going to reclaim his throne. So uh, the dust hasn't settled on the... I don't think it is all in the past. I think it's in the future. Okay. <laughs> we, we will see the return of Tony um, at w whenever C++ now happens again so um and i look for, i'm a huge uh i he, he emailed me once um when i i joined the canadian national body and he said my nemesis and i was like what like i'd never <laughs> interacted with tony before and he's like two of my favorite talks are words of wisdom and postmodern c++ um so but anyways it's it's all good fun um would you were you actually won like eight awards for that talk or something I don't like I I don't recall. Um, oh come on, you have a stack of them. <laughs> I know you do. Well, no. So John uh, John Cobb, the organizer, he says that there are uh, plaques or something, um, but I think he's got like a a few year like leg on sending those oh. out. So he oh, said. Okay. <laughs> um, but yes, it was it was a big surprise. Uh, the talk was very w well received, um, and I yeah, it was. I'm glad that people enjoyed it so much. Um, it was it was also my first talk too, so I I was very um, I was very surprised. Like I was expecting like feedback and like oh you know try this next time or try this that, uh, you know or tweak it slightly differently. Um, but yeah, so the 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 idea for the talk um, initiated from a combination of two things. It was watching uh, Sean Parent's C plus plus seasoning talk from Going Native twenty thirteen, which probably like. I've said and mentioned in like every podcast or talk that I've ever given um, because I think it's it's it, for me at least it was such an inspiring talk um, and it's it's yeah it's like 50% of the reason that I ended up giving the talk and then I stole the title from a previous CPP cast episode uh, I think it was the first time you had Kate Gregory on mm -hmm. on episode 30 where she had like a, a a little thing she said in the midst of the episode was that you know we spend a lot of time focusing on data structures. Um, but not as much time focusing on algorithms. And she said this quote that was like, for people that, um, you know, we need to develop algorithm intuition or like an intuition for algorithms, I think were, was her exact words, and that in 10 years, people that haven't done this are going to be trailing behind sort of other folks. And as a listener, like you hear that and you're like, oh no, like FOMO, like I'm going to be <laughs> left behind. My, my employer is no longer going to employ me if I don't know these algorithms. Um, so I slowly started uh, trying to learn them and then I sort of just went on this journey of uh, having sort of insights about like, oh, this algorithm is similar to this algorithm. Um, so like one of probably like my biggest eureka moments in the first talk um, was when I was trying to solve this problem that I won't go into the details, but the gist of it is like you have two ranges and you're trying to uh, index into both of them and then do some kind of um, either mapping operation or reduction operation. 
Um, in this case, I think it specifically was you were taking two ranges and then binding them together and ending up with a single value. Uh, so there's sort of like a, a zip in there and then a transform and then a reduction. Um, and in Python, they have an uh, algorithm called zip, uh, which we do not have in C++ currently, um, although that is in the uh, planned C++23 um, range algorithms mm. uh, to be pr proposed. So we, we will get it in the future, but at the time we didn't. And uh, that meant that there was no way, at least that I could see at the moment, to solve it with an algorithm. So I had sort of a for loop for my C++ solution. And then for Python, I had uh, a zip with a sort of destructuring. So you're zipping two ranges together using like the equivalent in Python of C++ 17 structure bindings. And then um, using an a algorithm uh, combined with sort of a generator expression to do it in like a single or two lines, um, which I thought was like super nice. Um, and then... Two weeks after I had sort of made a YouTube video about how, uh, you know, Python's um, solution was uh, much nicer than the C++'s solution, I realized that we actually did an algorithm that implicitly was doing a zip, and I just had made, had didn't know about it. Um, and that algorithm was inner product. Um, and then sort of in algorithm intuition, or the second follow-up on better algorithm intuition, I had a whole category of like, I think, five different algorithms um, that implicitly have zips in them. So to pause on inner product, you can think of an algorithm that takes two ranges and a binary operation and applies that binary operation to each element at the same index at a time. Um, that is essentially like a zipping algorithm. We just don't, in any of these algorithms, name them, you know, zip underscore something. Um, so inner product's the first one. I'm not sure if either of you two want to guess uh, what the other uh, four are. Or we can we can play a game. You can guess, and then our <laughs> listeners can guess as well. <laughs> What's terrible is I've watched this talk, and yeah. I can't tell you. <laughs> so the more the more general version uh, of inner product is std transform. So okay. the equivalent of zip with currently in like the pre C plus plus twenty three or C plus plus twenty um, range algorithms uh, is std transform that takes two ranges. Um, so, like, std transform is your sort of map from functional programming. Um, with When it takes one range, it's a map. When it takes two ranges, it's a zip width. Um, and then inner product is basically like a, a it's a std transform also with a reduction after it. So, like, a std, uh, a std transform takes just a single uh, lambda or function object um, that either applies to one range or two ranges std inner product, or as it was renamed in C++17, std transform reduce, uh, takes two lambdas, or two function objects. One of them does the transform, and then one of them does the reduction. Wait, wait, uh, are you saying inner product and transform reduce are the same algorithm? Uh, not identical, but basically std transform reduce is the parallel uh, renamed version of inner product. Yes. Okay. Um, and like, inner product... I know many, I think Matt Gobble uh, mentioned it in uh, one of his talks that he gave at um, the uh, Avast meetup that uh, Hannah Dusakova um, runs. She, uh, Matt Gobble gave a talk called, I think, C++, um, the old or the new old language or something like that. Um, and then also Ivan uh, Chukich, who's who wrote the functional programming in C++ mm -hmm. book, and he's given a number of talks. He mentions it in one of his as well that like inner product is a really bad name. Um, and I think uh, Alexander Stepanov chose it because he has a strong math background. And this algorithm is called inner product in like the mathematic, uh, the world of mathematics. Um, but really like as a generic algorithm, it's a bad name for it because inner product is like a domain specific name when really what you're doing is taking two ranges, um, you're transforming them into a single range with a binary operation, and then you're reducing it down to a single element with another binary op, uh, binary op in the form of a, what they call a reducer. Um, and I guess I should note also that the C++17 std transform reduce um, is also different in that it has an overload that takes uh, just a single range. Um, so inner product, you need two ranges, mm -hmm. um, but std transform reduce, you can, similar to std transform, you can give it either a single range that it first does a transformation on and then a reduction on, or you can give it the, the two ranges um, similar to std inner product. And the reason for that is that uh, it seems like why would you ever want a std 
transform reduce or inner product that takes a single range um, you can just sort of use a std accumulate or a std reduce and do the transformation in the reduction um, lambda or function object but the thing with the C++ 17 parallel versions the uh, transform reduce and reduce is that there are uh, stricter requirements on these algorithms because they are they can be performed in parallel so they have to the binary operations or unary operation the binary operations that you provide to it have to be both commutative and associative um, hmm. which means that uh, you are very restricted um, so like for, and for for example if you wanted to do like a parallel um, you wanted to calculate the total length of strings in a vector of strings um, in pre -C so you've got you know uh, a vector of strings that's got you know uh, uh, dog, cat, elephant, and mouse. And I don't know what the total, it's roughly like 10 or 15 characters. Uh, you know, dog and cat are three characters. And the idea is you want to get the total length of all the strings. In, in pre-C++ or C++ 17, like parallel algorithm world, you could just do a uh, uh, std accumulate um, that basically has an accumulator um, that's going to be the running sum of the total lengths. And then inside, you're going to go return of your lambda, you're going to go return accumulator plus uh, string dot size. Mm -hmm. um, so like in the arguments of your binary operation that it's a reduction, uh, the first element's your accumulator, which is going to be like an integer or a size, and the second uh, parameter is going to be a string. So that when you have a binary operation where the types are not the same, it's definitely not commutative and associative. Right. Um, so in order to do this in parallel, what you would need to do is use a std transform reduce, where the transform first turns the strings into lengths, of either you know size t or integer, and then the reduction uh, binary operation is now going to be accumulator of size t, and then also uh, an element of size t. So okay. you do the transform first, so that you can have a commutative and associative reduction binary operation. Hopefully, I didn't just put all the listeners to sleep. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, it helped from work. my perspective that I had actually the. Uh, once you started talking about transform reduce, I brought up the CBP reference page with the the overloads that are available. So I was glancing down at that and I was making sure I was following along. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully, if uh, if you're on a a Peloton, you can switch your your tree uh, your your park that you're in to the the CPP reference. And if you're on a run, I apologize. Um, <laughs> <laughs> This actually is very apropos uh, for me because just on Monday, Tuesday, I was prototyping some code and I'm like, I know there's an algorithm I should be using here, but I needed to do an offset over the same range. And I, with this to discussion about transform reduce and accumulate, I'm thinking, oh, if I just swap my reasoning a little bit, I can just simply apply an algorithm to it and it'll all fall out how I want it to. So... I'm going to have to take another look at that later. So coincidentally, uh, for what you just explained, inner product and transform reduce is exactly what you want for that. Yeah. Uh, so like one one of the common, uh, once someone once came up to me after a talk and were like, oh, here's a problem you can't solve with an algorithm, um, which was like, <laughs> Basically, and you're like, bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I prefer the more like, hey, is there an algorithm? Uh, the more like, hey, let's try and solve this together. But I also don't mind challenges. But it's the, you know, given a uh, array of elements, calculate like windowed sums. So if you've got a, an, a list of 20 elements, calculate, you know, um, the sum of five elements at a time from like first zero to four, then one to five, then two to six, et cetera. Okay. Um, and like very quickly, if your ranges and windows are big, you can get quadratic time complexity if you're doing um, the sums sort of repeatedly because you're having overlapping windows. So ideally, you don't need to like uh, recalculate the overlapping part. And so typically, if you're just doing it with a for loop, you calculate the sum of the first five. And then uh, for the next one, you subtract the first element off and then add the next element. So you're just doing subtracting one number, adding the next number, and then you're going to get something that runs in linear time. You can do this by first doing a std accumulate on the first five or n elements that you need in your window size, and then do a std transform reduce, where basically uh, you're carrying along some state of the previous element, and you start one range at the, begin or at the beginning and one range uh, at the sort of end of your window. Or so I don't even think you need to carry state, um, because uh, your first iterator is going to point to the element you want to drop, and then the next iterator is going to point to the one you want to add. Right. Um, so 
you can actually do it. It's a little bit, you're twisting the algorithms in a way that, you know, typically you're, when you use inner product or transform reduce, you're iterating over two different ranges over like the same sort of index. Um, but yeah, you, you can twist algorithms to do all kinds of crazy things. Well, it sounds very much like a, what you would need for like a moving average window. Like when I'm looking at my YouTube yep. stats and I'm looking at my 30 day moving average, I mean, that's basically the same thing. Yep. A lot of, um, a lot of like finance applications and programming language that are specific to finance, like have those algorithms built in because you can do them extremely efficiently. And if you're not careful, you can do them extremely inefficiently, but a lot of them uh, <laughs> just have it built in. And like, I know Q is a, an array programming language that's used by a lot of hedge funds. Um, and they in built into it have average and MAVG, which is for moving average. Um, Cause that's stuff they use all the time for like, ticker symbols and stock prices and whatnot. I think it's worth noting before we move past this also that every algorithm we've just discussed are the ones that are actually hiding in the numeric header, not in the algorithm header. Right. So if you right. go to look for them. <laughs> so yeah, this was, this was the sort of difference between my first talk, which I aimed to be on the algorithm header, but then I ended up falling in love with all the algorithms in the numeric header, um, which is sort of what I talked about. So inner product, accumulate, adjacent difference, iota, um, and I'm missing one. Uh, what's the fourth one? Inner product. Oh, well, someone's going to tell us online. Um, <laughs> and then the second talk that I gave focused on the algorithm header. Um, and that one was sort of very much in the same spirit um, and just trying to highlight sort of um, hidden relationships. So like, the two probably most useful are one that Sean Parent points out that whenever you have a find if, checked if the check if the so like this is a code review thing. If you ever have a std find if in your code, um, think about is the underlying data sorted? And if so, you can upgrade your linear find if to a log n um, binary search, either right. in the form of a lower bound or upper bound. Um, and then there's and then there's the binary search. And there's also two other algorithms that people don't think about very often, which is equal range. Um, which is also a binary search that just is like upper bound and lower bound at the same time. And then the fifth, like completely unheard of binary search um, partition point, which is actually an extremely useful algorithm. And like two times now at work, I've had a colleague come to me and say, hey, is there like a binary search algorithm for this where you need a binary sort of predicate that's looking for two elements that like, you know, they're part the range is partitioned and you're looking for the point where one of the elements returns true based on a predicate and the one to the right of it returns false. Um, and it's interesting, I just learned the other day that in the uh, C++ standard, they have a section for binary search algorithms, but they only list uh, four of them. They put partition point like next to partition in like a mutating section, um, huh. which hmm. I find very interesting. Um, anyways, and then there was a couple other things I pointed out. Um, the other relationship is the uh, std um, sort versus std partial sort versus versus std nth element. Um, so, so those this is that's algorithm a, intuition part two that you're discussing yeah, right now, right? Yeah, the technical title is, yeah, better algorithm intuition. Um, okay. And, uh, yeah, that code review is about um, if you have a sort, ask yourself, do you need to sort the whole range? If not, you might be able to save some runtime by doing a partial sort. And then if you're doing a partial sort and you don't actually need those elements that you're sorting, like to get the top n of them, if you don't need those in sorted order, uh, switch that to an nth element and now you have a linear runtime algorithm, um, mm -hmm. which I half the time forget about nth, nth element. Um, it's, it's a very useful algorithm with a cryptic name um, that can be very useful in, in certain cases. Kind of sounds like your job is is often becoming people saying, "Hey, Connor, is there an algorithm for this?" <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's my my job description, but um, it happens from time to time at work, and it's 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 so fun. I don't I I don't know. Different things turn different people's uh, clocks, um, but yeah, I love I love staring at a for loop and then realizing, "Holy smokes, this is just a this is just an a." You know, um, oh yeah, partial sum. That's the, uh, how can you forget that? That's the uh, the last C++11 um, <laughs> numeric algorithm. Because it's it's really should be called scan. Um, but yeah, like one time I saw a transform that just had an accumulator that was passing. It had like a mutable lambda. Um, or yeah, it was a mutable lambda that was carrying state. Um, and a transform that carries state is just a scan. Um, 
So like every once in a while, you you see you know either for loops or other algorithms that are doing something weird, and then you realize, well, there's actually like there's an exact algorithm for this. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I spend way too much of my free time um, thinking about you know uh, this stuff. <laughs> I think we've burned almost all of our time by asking you about algorithms. Now there's... <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I would definitely encourage our listeners to, to watch more of your talks. We'll, we'll put a link in the show notes with a, a list of all the talks you've been giving over the past few years. Um, I did want to maybe call back to something you, you mentioned about uh, you know ranges and how there there is going to be more coming for ranges in C++23. And you're actually working on, on a paper on that. Is that right? Yeah, so, well, very briefly, uh, I'll, I'll say first that um, Barry Revzin, he's the primary author and has done mm -hmm. uh, the majority of the work for this paper, so definitely can't talk about this without um, giving a shout-out to him. Uh, and then there was a small group of people. It uh, initially was Barry, myself, and Tim Song, um, and then later on, a few more people joined, so I apologize if I forget anyone, but um, uh, Corrington, uh, Christabella, um, Tristan Brindles... Um, and then I think Eric Niebler, even he, we got him to hop on a couple of calls or at least one call to make sure that, because we're basing this on all of his sort of range V3 work. Right. He's busy with executors and parallel algorithms right now. Um, but yeah, so uh, a bunch of us were meeting and, and uh, with the help of, you know, Barry sort of driving most of the authoring, we put together a proposal to what we think are the top priority uh, range adapters and views um, that we want to see in uh, C++23. So... I won't go through them all, but the ones that people are probably most going to be excited about um, are uh, Enumerate, which is sort of, uh, it's known by different things. It's from Rust and Python, it's Enumerate, which is uh, basically bundling an index with your range that with them with C++17 um, structure bindings, you can immediately destructure. Um, so like how many times have you used a range for loop from C++11, uh, but also needed the index for something? Right. Um, mm -hmm. So, like, this will avoid the anti-pattern of having to, like, declare an index outside your range base 4 or using one of just the old index base 4 loops. Um, zip is also uh, being proposed, and uh, the equivalent of zip with. So, zip just zips them into uh, a tuple together. Um, zip transform applies a binary operation to these zipped elements so that you just end up with a single range. Um, and... Yeah, I'll, well, and I'll say we're hoping to get uh, formatting, so like uh, std format support for ranges, which will be huge. Currently, right now, there's no real easy way other than setting up your own for loop to sort of print out a range. Um, and then we're also hoping to get ranges too, which is going to be super, super important for um, converting a range back into like a vector or something like that. Um, so, Oh, ranges it, underscore two. Uh, ranges or colon colon T O yeah something not, like that um, okay. okay yeah yeah well what what happened when Eric Niebler first joined one of the calls and someone said oh yeah ranges two it's the most important he thought that was like ranges with the numeric two as if yes. we were already abandoning the current design and <laughs> proposing a second version and he said oh did we already get is it already that old um, <laughs> but no yeah that's awesome. ranges colon colon two uh, it's a conversion me mechanism from ranges to insert whatever data structure you want. Um, yeah, I think it was proposed for C++20, but it just didn't make the cut because a lot of stuff, as you know, went into C++20. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, Connor, it's been great having you on the show again today. Um, where can people find you online? Um, I'm at code underscore report on Twitter. Um, and I think, yeah, if you're interested in any of the stuff we talked about in the show, uh, I just recommend, yeah, checking out the, the show notes, I'm sure. All the links will, will be there. And your YouTube channel. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't plug that enough. Um, <laughs> I have a YouTube channel, too. Uh, feel free to check that out. And, yeah, feel free to uh, listen to Bryce and I. Definitely is not going to be as polished as CPP cast. Um, and, uh, yeah, maybe we'll choose sides. Maybe TLB hit will we'll choose a side of either CPP chat or CPP cast. And then uh, we can have, like, a, a, a team battle or something. A showdown of some sort. Yeah. Podcast off, nice. a pod, 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 yeah, a podcast off uh, at some next in-person conference. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Thank oh, sorry. thanks, Connor. <laughs> oh, that's a compliment for me. Uh, it's all for Bryce. That's uh, keep it in the show. It's all good. <laughs> uh, Twitter's gonna have a field day with it. Um. <laughs> that's awesome.